well, from now on, I have to watch what I say in front of the team of Halakras. I've said that long time ago. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm very happy to be here. How's everybody? Good? All right, I know we're sitting for a long time and Rebecca preparing a video for us. We're going to start with the video. But before we do that, we do some stretching. And I have a small exercise that only involves raising your hand. So I'll ask a question, and there will be A, B, or C answers, right? So if your answer is A, you raise your hand. If you ask yourself today how happy you are. Okay? B, if you somehow during the last week ask yourself how happy you are. C, during the last month, I ask yourself. All right, so that's quick. One more, just in three seconds, from one to 10, measure your own happiness and write it down. Or remember it. All right, so you know your level of happiness from zero to 10, right? Okay, we have a quick video to show you. The United Arab Emirates was made in 1971. That means I'm 45 years old. The Bible is in the UAE. That's where I live, located right in the middle of the world. My great-grandfather was a fair guy. He used to go out to the sea and find fish. My father came to Dubai in the 70s as a businessman uh, and he still lives here. Mum and Dad came here when I was 18 months. I used to remember waking up in the morning and there'd be camels looking at me. I was born in the 80s and I saw Dubai just get built from what it was and what it is to be. No one ever thought of starting from a small sandy place to having Burj Khalifa. I came to school with people from France, Malaysia, France, Malaysia, South Africa. Dubai is all about the future and being at the forefront of technology and our buildings and our growth as a city. The best thing about teaching in Dubai is um, just learning from other people that I might not have ever come to know. Just the variety that we get in terms of professional development, in terms of the students that are coming in and out of our classrooms every day. Being able to teach in Dubai, being able to teach in a culture that is different from my own and also having access to different cultures as well. For me, that's the best thing, right? Teaching and learning at the same time. Holland, Dubai, Africa. With so many schools popping up all over Dubai, the knowledge of human. <laughs> I mean, happiness development authority was born. Because we do believe that, unlike the previous eras where, you know, you have to work hard to be successful and then you'll be happy in life, in today's terms, it's the other way around. It's actually you have to start with happiness. Australia, America. I've spent uh, quite a lot of time working with the KHD. What impresses me most is, is how forward thinking they are willing to consider new things. And I think that's that's that, that's a cultural thing that goes right the way across Dubai. So about three years ago, we started making changes to our physical environment here. And, and what we have noticed by knocking down the walls and getting rid of offices and creating an open space and happy space, a greener space, there is a greater sense of people wanting to work with each other now. And our government, with a post for a minister of happiness. This is really a good sign for us. It's completely enriched my life. My mum and dad only came on a two-year contract and they're still living here now. It feels home when I'm in Dubai. But this is like the whole world's in my classroom. Well, I hope you enjoy that, and I think my next segment will require some volunteers, because to show you that this video is not something, you know, we made up, so I'll use real holacracy people who've been to KHDA, right? So my first volunteer is, Karen. so, yeah, Mike, so in 30 seconds, describe three things about this place. We didn't rehearse this one. 30 seconds? Yeah. 
love, uh, care, and a dynamic, open environment. Uh, that might be more than three. There's no offices, very few walls. Um, uh, get, customers are guests. We are all mingling together. And um, yeah, like everything is happening in the same place. Uh, it's very inviting. Everything from the parrots to the teddy bears to um, how, how we are actually in meetings as well. Oh, very good. Thank you. No? Okay. In 20 seconds. 20 seconds. <laughs> Describe the people in this place. Oh, uh, the people at KHGA are my new family. Uh, I arrived as a guest and was greeted with popcorn and a hot chocolate with a heart on top. And I left two weeks later with an Emirati name, Ismi Parasha Fatma. And uh, with Abaya and with love in my heart for the people I can't wait to return to because they are my new family. Thank 19 you. 19 seconds. Wow. <laughs> my last volunteer is Olivier. In 10 seconds. <laughs> 10 seconds, because the, the clock is on. When you left that place, one feeling you left with? No. Um, well, okay, that might be more than uh, 15 seconds, but uh, I, well, I was very surprised when I got there, actually. I was not expecting uh, the welcoming. I mean, the Arabic culture is a, is a peach culture versus a coconut culture, if you're familiar with the distinction. Uh, it's really welcoming. Uh, honestly, the feeling I, I left with is a uh, uh, kind of a feeling of I got invited to a wedding. I spent like two weeks there, and I got invited to a wedding by someone a local there. Uh, so I felt um, like I'm gonna come back. You know, I'm gonna come back, and it doesn't feel over. Thank you. So, and to my next segment, I will ask. Not for a volunteer, since this is Halakracy. We're going to do Halakracy presentation, so I'm asking, and I asked two of my colleagues to join me. But I think before I do that, just remembering that one time a wise man said, to understand something, you have to go backward. But to live something, you have to go forward. So really to understand a little bit backward from where we came, I will ask Joe to come to the stage and tell you how this, our story for the last maybe three and a half years has started and actually started with Joe bringing me some cards during Christmas. Okay. See, I'm not the boss. <laughs> we'll go back a bit further. It was actually 2011. And if we go back to that stage of history, I'll just talk briefly about what was going on in our, our part of the world. So we're in the business of education and uh, every newspaper headline was terrible teachers, terrible exam results, UAE at the bottom of the international assessments, just bad news everywhere. At the same time we came across a guy called David Cooper Ryder. anybody heard of him? Appreciative inquiry. So we thought, right, let's uh, turn our attention to what's going well, what's working. So we had a look at the staff engagement survey. Anybody do those? Staff satisfaction surveys? Okay. So staff satisfaction and staff engagement surveys, people are coming back, the same old things. Not enough time, managers, not that great, uh, not enough money. And we thought, hold on, we're getting stuck into this. Um, every time we do a staff engagement or staff satisfa satisfaction survey, we all look at the results together and we all say, yeah, we'll change these results. And then the next time it's the board meeting and you're looking back and doing the same thing. So we saw a guy who did something many of you will know about. I know the Netherlands came in at number 14, called the Happy Planet Index. I called Nick Marks, who's a statistician, worked for the National uh, New Economics Forum. And he said, come on, let's have a look at measuring happiness. So I brought Dr. Abdullah a Christmas present, which looked like this. Um, what Nick said is, let's not be so serious about this. Why don't we just try measuring our own happiness and then see what happens from there? And he's got a framework. He's a Brit, so we, we had a little framework already of five things. 
In Britain, we're supposed to eat five portions of fruit and vegetables every day. So he just chose the number five. And he said, look, there's five elements about happiness. Let's not get stuck into what the definition of happiness is, because depending on where you go in the world, you'll get a hundred. But we all sort of generally know what it means. So here are the five elements. Connect with the people around you. Be active. Take some time to do some exercise, walk, go fishing. Take notice. Pause for a while. Be grateful for what you're around. Do some meditation. Keep learning. And finally, the largest and the biggest contributor, give. Whether that's a smile or whatever, your time or whatever. So that's where we started. We decided to start with a happiness survey. Thank you, Joe. So you would guess that was Christmas. Two months later, I was in London. I gave this guy a call. He said, I get this Christmas card from somebody. You might want to have a coffee. He said, who are you from Dubai? With you? So he, he hesitated. So anyway, he came up and we had a, had a coffee with him. And I realized immediately that he also have a survey. It's called Happiness Survey. So immediately, a month later, we rolled it out in the organization. Happiness Survey was around April, May 2014. We give the numbers up. It's 6.1 out of 10. So, which puts you in the top 35% of the organization. In the same time, uh, our government um, issue reports on all, all the departments every year about satisfaction and whatnot. So our, not staff satisfaction, but our customer satisfactions, we at that year get 95.1%, which actually we get an award for, which is good. But then we wonder, where is the 4.9? And then this is where you look at the sheet, the other sheet, which is the staff satisfaction. And our staff satisfaction was less, was about 90, 80, 89. So exactly the difference. So we thought to ourselves, hang on a second. If we win, if we want the extra 4.9, we have to work on adding 4.9 to our to our team. So we run the, the satisfaction or the happiness. And what we found out is, I think it was there was a board meeting internally and where somebody was about to present the HR dashboard, right? And every time somebody from HR stands up and want to put something up, everybody feels start negative about it, right? So, I mean, you get the sense of the feeling. And I think I remember asking the question is, hang on, do you want this guy to present or not? Because everybody start, you know, playing with their phones and stuff. I said, not really. So, okay, fine. Why don't we just cancel HR? Not from the presentation, but why don't we cancel HR from the organization? Yeah? Okay. The reason behind it is because nobody wants to listen to any HR presentation. <laughs> but the fact that, you know, I think if you think, if you think deep inside, many people try to, you know, try to say, why does... HR normally is about two to three percent of your organization, right? Two to three, four, five percent as a team. Why is that two, three percent of the team controls everything? The second thing which I notice, many of the people, with a, whenever we've done a star satisfaction or engagement or happiness, we tend to do this mistake over and over again. We outsource our satisfaction, our happiness engagement to who? to HR. And that's something very fundamental to happiness. You cannot outsource happiness. You can source it. You can outsource everything in your life, but not happiness. That's something you have to insource yourself. So these are the reasons, okay, let's cancel HR. And then the team said, all right, okay, so what are we going to do? Well, the HR, we have a small team of HR. They are good people. There's nothing wrong with them, just the functions. So we had a big board, white board, and we said, okay, what are the functions that are needed in HR? Recruiting, development, uh, performance. I mean, I think you see it in the apps, right, in this room. And then we, we look at, you know, paperwork. And then we also look at exiting, you know, people exit. So, okay, if these are the main functions, why don't we let the team for the next six months to come up to this board and write what do they want? And over a period of time, we notice who are more interested in this and who's more interested because of the feedback they write on the board. And this is before we done halakrasi. 
And then what we've seen there is the, for example, I will take the recruitment and said, okay, people are writing interesting stuff. And, you know, I said, okay, why don't you guys get together and see and tell us what you want to do for, for recruiting or onboarding. And then uh, we ask Hind, who is here, who is to come here to us and talk to us. I said, why, I said, why don't you get some people from the organization as long as they're not senior manager or titles or whatnot, some people who are really reflect what the organization is all about. And get on and let's look at how do we bring on different people to the organization. But there's one thing I will do from now on. As of today, recruitment's frozen until you come up with a better word or a better uh, system for it. And then she calls it scouting. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Um, yes, it wasn't as pleasant as it sounds now because <laughs> I was called. He didn't have an office, but there was a closed meeting room where you can't recruit. So if when anybody in the organization needs recruitment, they look at me and say, what's happening? Recruitment till we completely revamp. Let's give you a bigger setting of how we operate in Dubai. We're a government organization. So, and there are, and we're one of the newest and smallest government organizations in the Bay. So we have others that has been operating for 30 years, 40 years with thousands and thousands of employees. Their working hours start from 7.30 to 2.30, while our working hours actually, it really depends, it's 24 seven. Officially we stop at 4.30, but we don't stop at 4.30. So whoever approaches us, will be looking at a very similar package. It's the government that I work for. I expect pension. I expect a job title. I expect promotion at the end of the year, all of these. So that was a completely different pool we're looking at. And we're talking about happiness, and we're talking about purpose, and we're talking about engagement. So what I went is I went to four or five happy people within the organization and said, look, this is my speaking with holocracy language. This is my tension. We didn't know about the tensions back then. And they came up with this method where they said, OK, the first thing is we really don't know. We don't want to see anyone's CV. And we are really not interested in having an interview. What we are, and they are mainly millennials who have this, who I had this conversation with. So they said, okay, we really want to see whoever is applying to our organization. We want to see their selfie. What do you mean by selfie? Yeah, I mean, not just the photo. We'll just ask them a few questions of, you know, what's their uh, biggest failure? What's the best work environment they'd like to work for? What, which book they connect to? Which movie star they think they resemble most? We don't want to know how many years they went to college, what experience they had, and all of that. And I said, okay, let's design an app. So we've designed an app with these three to four questions. And then, based on those answers, character-based, um, whoever is the team review and whoever they think will be happy in this organization and thrive is invited for something called the Open Week. So within the Open Week, usually um, we have, um, we shortlist around 30 to 40 people. They come in during the Open Week and we give them problems that we are facing as an organization. They work in groups and towards the end of the week they present them. And they work with everybody in the organization. Towards the end of the open week, we ask everybody who got the opportunity to work with any of the candidates is, will this person thrive in the organization or not? So it's an answer of yes and no. So whoever goes get the most um, votes will join us for an experience for three months. We call it living at KHDA. It's an immersive experience. Everybody is paid the same. You can have a PhD, double PhDs, 20 years of experience, but you still get the same package because you are moving into a culture of organization. So they will spend three months with us. Um, some of them say halfway through, this is too much. I'm really not interested. I'm handling 12 projects at the same time. I'm working with hundreds of people. I, this is not my cup of tea or whatever it is. And they leave while others, they stick around. Towards the end of the three months, we select few from those who joined us for the three months period to join us on a full-time basis. 
We give them the choice to whatever job titles they want to uh, have. I mean, currently it's role. It's much easier with holacracy. We didn't have this. We didn't know about holacracy back then. We had to operate on a hierarchical system with job title. So we gave them the option. What job title do you have? And everybody agreed to be a happiness agent because they will bring happiness to whatever projects they join. And this is what we've been doing for the last three years. Thank you, Hen. So, and, and the first batch we had, the shortlisted top three, I remember that a couple of years ago, and then they wanted to have a word with me. And I said, fine. And they told me, and I said, are you sure you want to stay with this organization? You know, you've been three months, you still don't, you know? And they said, yeah, yeah, we sure we want to work in this organization. So I made them an offer. Whoever willing to leave at that first badge, I was going to give them 100,000 dirham. That's about $30,000 just to walk away. Nobody took in, nobody taking that. And then somebody asked me later why. I said, you know, I didn't want anybody to have a single doubt that this is not the right place for them. Because what we wanted to do is we wanted to have people that want the organization, not need the organization. So we wanted to be very sure about it. So the, that scouting, well, it's a circle, I mean, now it's a role and all of that, but it was a people that get involved together to create this. And then the other functions of HR, we distributed them. I mean, Joe also looks after the Thrive. So we change learning and development to Thrive. And then their first day, you know, they do a lot of yoga and exercise. And we go over the circle, but the most interesting circle for me was the last circle, we call it the reset. So in many organizations today, you find, you know, maybe 10, 15% of people who sort of will be there long enough and just sort of lost that love and feeling. It's not there anymore, right? So, and I really don't see it, they don't show it, but they're just sticking around. And this is really very actively disengaged. So what we've created a button called a reset button, it's not physical, I mean, it's, it's a person. <laughs> and then says, you know, I want to have a second chance in life. I want to try this again, but different place, doing different things. Can you help me out? And people thought people will not press this button. But actually, I think last year we had about 15, per, 15 people from different levels. I actually went to this person and said, look, we pressed the reset button. And we re-inducted again to the organization. So, I mean, this is very important to us because later on, when we, we worked on this one and we kept measuring the happiness of the staff and our last survey, which we conducted last November, we scored 7.5 out of 10 and that put us in the top 10% of the organization. <laughs> now to take a little bit step back, say how did we move into, how did, why did we choose Halakrasi or Halakrasi chose us in that sense is the fact that we needed our people to be even happier. And through organization like Action of Happiness, who we work with, we got to know a little bit about Zappos. And then we went to Zappos and, and we seen, and this is where I think our first time we, we've seen holacracy, holacracy at work. So, but I think the fact that I'm going back to the purpose why we've done this or whether onboarding or the holacracy, our purpose is actually to increase the happiness of our people. And I think this morning, Michael, I don't know if he's still here. Um, he said something about government department. He said he found it a hard time because, you know, it's very hard to convince people. Uh, you, government that, that you need people to be happy. You know, that's something that you worry about. Actually, we're very lucky because in our country, our prime minister who wrote a couple of books about happiness and positivity, and when his first book came out, in his opening statement, he said, when he get asked about what is the role of the government, he answered the role of the government is to bring happiness to people. That is the role of the government. And he translated that on action. So last year we had a new post in our cabinet. One of them is Minister of Youth, 22 year old girl. We have a Minister of the Future and definitely we have a Minister for Happiness. So now everything we are doing is attached to the happiness. So we don't have to justify why we are doing it. But the way also we get about it is very important that we did not want to work with Michael or any person 
to increase their happiness so they can perform better. No, we wanted to work with Michael to improve their happiness because he's a person, not because of any indicator, because this is something we always get, and I think it was across the last two days I attended a lot of measurements, measuring and measuring and measuring. And we have safaris also. I mean, we have safaris every week. People come in and look around and, you know, they compare us very much to Google or somebody said that, that they Google, which is KHDA and Google combined somehow. <laughs> and, and we get everything. So, and we, the number one question is, how do you know this is working? What's your measurement tool? And I said, look, I don't know. I mean, you know, existing measuring tool won't give you that because when you talk about happiness and well-being, you talk about a new dimension, you talk about emotional dimension. Your KPIs might not capture it, and maybe some of the existing tool today is too small to capture something that big. But I said, for me, we've been doing this for the last couple of years, and I don't hear people complaining. And when you walk to the environment, I mean, as you described it, it's a very happy place, it's a very happening place. And if we look at our results and in international assessment, it's getting even better and better. So, I mean, I think when you go to that journey sometimes, just because you don't have the measurement tool right now, that does not mean you don't do it. I mean, well-being and happiness is something so fundamental, and I think if you don't do it, then what else you are doing? I thank you for giving me this uh, time, and ready for some questions. Thank you. Yeah, great. We have some time for questions about insourcing happiness or getting rid of a HR function, whatever. Marco. Uh, you started with a very intriguing, intriguing uh, observation. You said it was like going to my own funeral, uh, adopting holacracy. And that spurs to me the question is, and what part of you died? I said that statement last December. And we had the team from Holacracy came for training. And we trained about 50 people, I remember, and in the closing round. And they asked everybody how they feel. And actually, I made that statement. Because from the very beginning of this organization, we, and we are 10 years old. We actually we celebrated 10 years last April. So as a 10 years old, from the very beginning, we always thought there will be a day that we will not be here as an individual. And I always describe it to my team, the day I'm going to be hit by a bus, hopefully it's a small one, not a big bus, what happens? And I always wonder what happens, but when I get involved a little bit with the holacracy work, I said, yeah, actually, you can be dead there. And you know, you're attending your own funeral, and I said, how is it working? You're, because now you are not making a decisions anymore. You are not telling people, you are people not coming to you. And honestly, and I think it's, 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 it feels good, because at least you are still alive and you are listening to what people are saying about you, not when you are dead six feet under <laughs> and they keep saying things about you and you, won't, you can't get up there and correct them. I guess it's, uh, and you can create that. I mean, I think you can create like, you know, multiple lives and that's a life you had and fine, yeah, goodbye. And then you have another life with holacracy or whatnot. So I think it's, it's good that you simulate such an experience and reflect on it because it will happen to you. Thank you. Next question. Yeah. Uh, definitely, uh, holacracy increments happiness because it, it really promotes autonomy. And autonomy is a psycholo psychological need we all desperately need. And uh, it, it definitely, in, 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 in those terms, it really does promote that but at the beginning, when you start with holacracy, especially you have a lot of extroverts in, in your in your meeting, they you know they're asked they're asked to shut up, you know, because there is a process and you have to follow the process. For some, for some people that may not sound uh, close human enough. And so um, my question to you that that you are so much into happiness, how do you manage that? process until yeah. they, they, they saw the benefits of autonomy. I mean, I think we're fortunate because we had advantages. I mean, everyone, every organization, every university has advantage. Our advantage was we young and small in size. We are 300 compared to other government department. We young, we are only 10 years old. 
I mean, when we start doing this work was probably we're six, seven years old. So being young and small, your mistakes are very forgiven because you are young. And then there are small scale mistakes that are not big. So it gives you a room to try things out. And I think we're lucky also with the fact that we started to make changes four years ago. And a lot of it with the environment you've seen, the physical environment, when we start getting rid of offices and started actually with me said, I don't want an office because for me, office was making me unhappy. People coming up to your office to bring you a problem, <laughs> right? You call your PA, I need to see Mike because you have a problem. So office is always a problem for you. So I want to get rid of it. And then we said, okay, do you want to get rid of your office? Oh yes, but we are not sure noise level, you know, how people are comfortable, not. So it's fine, we'll put this, uh, they call them a sound detector in the, in the ceiling. So if the noise level is going up, people will train themselves to, to adjust accordingly, which for six months, those alarms never, never went off because there was no batteries in them. <laughs> <laughs> but we couldn't tell them that. So I think my point, in, my point is, is we've gone through a lot of physical hardware change to create that environment which actually did, it did install a trust in the team that they are up for any change. They really wanting to make things better. But most importantly, it installed the trust in our customers that who keep seeing those changes for the last three, four years. And I think the fact that those changes, we took them because we want people to be happy. So first thing, you get rid of the things that doesn't make you happy. And then, and then you start. And I think what we've noticed is, Exactly what you're describing is, if you are really in the, in, the, in the right track for happiness, you'll find yourself doing two things. One, it's never enough. You wanna do more, you wanna do more, it's very addictive. The second thing, which if you are really in the right road of happiness, you're going to start to sacrifice things. Happy people are those who sacrifice the most and the closest to them. So I think having the team gone through those journey of letting go where it's hard and, and, and get asking for more. So when we start introducing holacracy to them, it was, yeah, this is, I mean, for us was the, we have the hardware set up. We need the operating system, but the team have gone through three years of continuous changing. And initially three years ago to be something, okay, guys, let's change something with me, me and a couple of guys. Oh, uh, sure, another change coming. So the appetite for a change was not there. Today, if there is a week without change, people will wonder, okay, maybe I'm not the same guy or the team is the same guy. So a culture that is now built on change and new and innovative and creative and crazy and cool or, or sometimes super cool, that's the culture I think it's really helping us to onboard um, holacracy. It's a long answer. I missed that in my speech. Thanks. There's a question over there. Yes. Um, uh, uh, Ruben told us his reason for wanting his employees to be happy, which was uh, having them reach their maximum potential. Um, do you have a reason for wanting yeah. your employees to be happy? Yeah. Um, I think this is something we ask ourselves really was not when we started happiness, but when we started working with holacracy, because you have to find a purpose, right? So we didn't have to look very far. Said, so look, we are, our business today is to make education better. We are a regulator. All right. So let's, let's our purpose as an organization become the same purpose of what education is all about. And for me always, if I, if I want to look at what things are supposed to be, I will pick up a Latin dictionary or something. I said, you know, during that era, why somebody created education? So if you look, at, if you look up the Latin dictionary, education will say something like educare. It means English wise to bring out from within. So I said, if that's the purpose of education and that's our business, why don't that become our purpose to bring out from within, not necessarily so they can peak perform or do something like that, because I think that goes to 
you know, changing that conventional um, wisdom that says, you know, you have to work hard to be happy so you can, you can perform to be happy. I think these days the other way around. People need to be happy at the beginning. Eventually, they will work hard and success will happen. And some people argue with me, what if they don't? I say, okay, so what? At least you made people happy. <laughs> Can't go wrong with that one. Thank you very much. Any, yeah, that's one. No. You talked a little bit about the, uh, uh, I think you call it a reset button roll. Is it a roll? Can, I don't think I caught all of it. Is it. Does it keep, help people reintegrate into the organization or out? I mean, actually, I, I, when, when, when we introduced the concept, we used, it, we used the word resurrection. Oh, okay. <laughs> people didn't like that very much. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, it's my idea, you know. That. So they, they call it a reset button. But the idea is, in a way, that look. I mean, if people move move on from the organization and and walk away and go to do something different, it's they will always remember how did they leave the organization. That, that last one month or two months before you leave, that's what register with you. Not the 10 years. People will remember that last couple of weeks or months. And people might not remember what you said or done to them, but what they will register with them is how they felt during that time. How did you make them feel? So our reset button is saying, look, <coughs> You don't have that anymore. You, you don't have that love and feeling. You just lost there. Okay, fine. Can we, can you tell us more? Can we give you another chance? Can we find you a place? If not, can we find you a place somewhere else? Can we help you? Because it's not your mistake. It's our mistake that all of these changes that are taking place, even sign up for it. We signed up for the thing that we had in the past, but we've changed and it's our fault. So can we either train you, you buy, change things to so you can fit all over again, or we find you something different. And people were worried about, okay, if I'm going to go and press this reset button, well, people will know now I don't like this organization anymore. But people before did not know. And yes, it took some time, but as I said, last year we have 15 people says, look, you know, I want to be resetted again. But that shows you the, the trust that they have in the organization. Thank you. There are other questions? Okay. Then thank you very much for your presentation, all of you, all the team, and also answering our questions. That's great. Thank you. Thank you.